thanks for joining us again. We are working through some audio issues on Pastor John's end, so thank you for your patience with us as we figure out some connection issues that we're facing. We open the week with an email from a listener named Daniel who writes, Hello, Pastor John. I recently watched your sermon about the prodigal son, a tender word to Pharisees. There you mentioned the one flaw of the older brother was that he had a broken view of his father. The older brother saw the father as a master and viewed him as a lawgiver. But there are some verses in the scripture that point to Jesus as our Lord or our master. So how can we see God as our loving, gracious father, but also take him as our king and Lord and all for our joy? Pastor John, what would you say? That question goes right to the heart of what it means to be a Christian and how to live the Christian life. How do we relate to God and the Lord Jesus? As a slave master? As a friend? As a counselor? As a shepherd? As an employer? As a doctor? As a savior? As a redeemer? A helper? A a servant of us? This is a huge question about who God and Jesus are for us and how, hour by hour, we do our Christian living in relation to them and how they relate to us. Now, the parable of the prodigal son was spoken by Jesus in response to the criticism of the Pharisees that he was eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners, Luke 15, 2. The younger brother squandering his life and possessions in debauchery represents the tax collectors and sinners. The older brother in the parable, dutifully staying at home, complaining about mercy being shown to the younger brother, unwillingness to join the party that celebrates the return from death to life, he represents the Pharisees. So when the father This is amazing. When the father goes out on the porch to entreat the older brother to come in and celebrate mercy and forgiveness and reconciliation, that's an illustration of Jesus desiring for the Pharisees, even speaking to the Pharisees, desiring them to humble themselves and be glad that Messiah has come in mercy towards sinners. And and here's what the older brother says to the father after that entreaty. Look, these many years I have served you, doulao, the Greek, acted like a servant, slave. I have served you. I never disobeyed your command, like the father's drill sergeant or master. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. Now, my point that Daniel uh, referred to in his question is that the older brother speaks of his relationship to his father as if he were a master or a boss, or a lawgiver. He says, these many years I have served you. And the father tries to reorient his thinking with these words, son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. In other words, you're a son, number one, not a slave. Two, You're with me in the house. You're not in the slave quarters. Don't act like you are. Number three, you're an heir. You don't need a goat. You have everything. So um, enjoy your position as a son and receive freely my inheritance. You didn't deserve it. It's free. And since it's free, won't you consider it fitting That's verse 32. It was fitting to celebrate and be glad that your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. If you were living in the freedom of the undeserved bounty of my fatherhood, you would be glad that grace was being poured out on your brother because it's being poured out on you. So Daniel asks, rightly, but doesn't the New Testament present God 
and Jesus as a master, or a lord, or a ruler, or a commander, and us, appropriately, as obedient and submissive, so that we can even be called, yes, Paul identifies himself as a slave. And the answer, of course, is yes, it does. So the question becomes, how do you put the two together? I think that's what Daniel's asking. And the crucial part of the answer is to realize that when we are called slaves of Christ, the analogy uh, implies two things, but not a third thing. <clears throat> it implies, one, that he owns us. Absolutely true. First Corinthians 6, 19, you're not your own. You were bought with a price. You are mine. Number two, to be the slave of Christ implies he has absolute right to tell us how to live. Yes, he does. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? Luke 6, 46. But here's the key. The analogy of master and slave does not include that we provide services without which the master would be impoverished. It does not include the implication that the master is decisively dependent on us for the meeting of his needs, like masters were dependent on slaves to meet their needs on earth. Or to put it positively, the coming of Jesus reveals most clearly that our relationship to God and to his Son is shaped most decisively by the fact that he works for us, not that we work for him. That is most decisive. We're not Christians if we don't get that about this relationship. Only in realizing and trusting and enjoying that he serves us, works for us, are we enabled fully to serve him him. This is what the older brother did not understand. Now, here's some texts that point in this direction. Mark 10, 45, the Son of Man came not to be served. We pass over that negative half of the verse so often as we hasten to, but he gave his life a ransom for many. He did not come to be served. Don't serve him, meaning don't relate to him as though he needed your help. He doesn't need your help. He's here to help you. The gospel is not a help-wanted sign. Acts 17.25, God is not served by human hands as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. So our service to God, if we ever use the phrase, which we should because it's biblical, our service to God is fundamentally transformed from the usual slave-master relationship because this master supplies everything this slave needs and is not served by the slave as though he needed anything. God is the, the giver in this relationship. We are the receiver and the beneficiary. How do, the, do we then serve? And 1 Peter 4.11 is my favorite expression of the answer. It goes like this. Whoever serves, let him serve in the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. So we are being served by God every millisecond of our lives as he supports our being and gives us all the strength we need so that all of our giving and serving is a receiving first. And that's what it means to live by faith. So maybe the way to say it is this, until we rest and rejoice in God and Christ as our all-forgiving, all-providing Redeemer and Father, we will always serve him as a slave in the old way, not the new way. But when we see ourselves as first served by Jesus decisively, then our service becomes joyful, dependent on his service. So Paul says, the life I live I live by faith in the Son of God, trusting his blood-bought, 
ever arriving grace. Amen. Thank you, Pastor John. And uh, what a unique relationship uh, also that, as we say around here, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. And uh, it truly takes a lifetime to really understand and appreciate how these things work in beautiful harmony. Thank you again, Pastor John. Well, this is my chance to invite you to subscribe to our audio feeds and to search our episode archive and even reach us by email with a difficulty you're facing in your own life. Do all that through our online home at DesiringGod.org forward slash Ask Pastor John. Well, next Tuesday, we celebrate July 4th, Independence Day, as it's known here in the States, and the day raises questions about national loyalty. Uh, How do we who are strangers and exiles, aliens and pilgrims on this earth, how do we think about patriotism? Pilgrims and patriots, that was our topic back in episode number 378. But this year, we're going to speak to church leaders, and how much patriotism is too much patriotism in the local church on Sundays. It's an important question, and we will address it on Wednesday. I'm your host, Tony Ranke. We'll see you then.